Located at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, in a state that prides itself on 300 days of sunshine, it's easy to see the appeal of the Mile High City. It is vibrant, it is diverse, it's entrepreneurial, and I think it's gonna be a leading figure in the United States economy for decades to come. From 2010 to 2020, more than 115,000 people moved to Denver. That's about a 20% increase. But housing these new residents has proved increasingly difficult. About half of the state's housing shortfall was concentrated in Denver in 2021. You had all this demand coming in and very low supply. There simply aren't enough people in Denver and the Denver area to build the number of homes that the market really needs. In many ways, we're probably uh, a victim of our own success. Over the years, we've seen new corporate headquarters uh, relocate to Colorado, and we've truly seen, I think, an economic boom. But while the area is going through a boom, there are about two jobs for every individual looking for work. It's been estimated that the labor shortage and skills mismatch cost the state around $40 billion in GDP loss annually. You're going to see a lot of value creation, jobs, technology, revolutionizing everything from consumer tech to medical to uh, cybersecurity over here in the next decade. And Colorado is the epicenter of that. But will the state of Colorado and the city of Denver be able to keep up? Voted as one of the best cities in the U.S. to live and visit, and home to one of the country's hottest music scenes, Denver has put its mark on the map. Colorado is no stranger to different waves of migration into the state starting in the 70s, people from the coast coming to the state of Colorado for a different way of life. Denver is now home to thriving technology sectors. Of the 50 largest metro areas, the region ranked first in absolute aerospace employment. It's a very robust and thriving employer base and also a great companion, as you know, to a lot of other legacy businesses and manufacturing others that use those tools to grow and scale. So we think it's been a great accelerant for Denver over the last decade. When taking into account the size and maturity of its business network, Denver ranked as the 19th startup city in the world. Sports and entertainment is also booming. Red Rocks Amphitheater ranked as the fourth busiest entertainment venue globally in 2023 and the city's four major sports teams bring in more than a billion dollars of annual revenue. GDP is up more than 50% compared to 2017 for Denver County. Of all of Colorado's metro areas, the city saw the highest number of jobs added in 2023. The city's attractive lifestyle mixed with ample job opportunities have attracted many new residents from outside the state. We have some of the highest educated residents in the country. Now that's not necessarily because they have come out of our own education system. I and many other people come from the coasts. And so that's something that has been described as the Colorado paradox, right? That on the one hand, people who are born and raised in our education system don't necessarily have the degree attainment that we would like. And yet the state has been very good at importing people who have been educated by other states. This influx of highly educated workers while longtime residents are unable to catch up has caused a divide between the have and have nots. So much like in other cities like San Francisco, where prices went sky high, you see more people who are in sectors where they don't make as much money. They're having to move farther and farther out from the city. As Metro Denver continues to grow, housing and lack thereof is at the forefront of politicians' minds. The city is short 70,000 homes. The answer to housing in our case is not further and further out, because we have the land, and that's in many ways the default, but that means longer commute times, more congestion, worse air quality. So it's how do we live in a way where we don't sacrifice that quality of life. We want this both to be one of the hottest economic markets in the country, and we want it to still be the maybe only booming city where you can also be the second grade teacher who teaches school in Denver and you can still live down the street from the school that you teach. You know, most of those post-boom cities, the San Francisco's and others, you don't have teachers or nurses or firefighters who live in San Francisco anymore. But right now, that's not realistic. A report by the Colorado Education Association found that 50% of educators struggled to afford housing costs in 2023. The average price of a home in Denver is about $580,000, up about 65% since January of 2016. That compares to the national average of around $360,000. That's a detriment to homeownership for families making a hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand, still very hard to be able to get a down payment, monthly interest payments uh, on a six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand dollar home. The median household salary sits just below ninety thousand dollars. 
The entire country is in a housing shortage right now simply because after the Great Recession, builders stopped building. In Denver, it's particularly acute because you have so much new demand. You had people moving there from California when home prices got too high there. Then also during the pandemic, you had people saying, hey, if I can work anywhere, why not work in Denver? Because I'm right at the foot of the Rockies. In 2023, it was estimated that Colorado would need 220,000 construction workers by 2027, an increase of 40,000 from its total of about 180,000. That's off to a rocky start as 2,400 construction workers were lost in the past year. To incentivize more people to high demand fields like construction, the state has passed bills offering scholarships to recent high school graduates. The whole idea is to get more lower priced housing into the market, whether it's tax incentives or incentives for the builders. It's not for the high end of the market, to be sure. It's to get more affordable housing into the Denver market, because right now it just doesn't exist. Colorado had 200,000 job openings and about 114,000 unemployed individuals in February of 2024. That's nearly two jobs for every one person looking for work is a little misleading. And I think the issue is ultimately comes down to a mismatch. Just because a job is available doesn't mean someone is necessarily trained and ready to go for that occupation. That's the Colorado paradox Wasserman was speaking about earlier. The city and the state as a whole is experiencing robust growth with plenty of jobs available. But many born and raised in the state don't have the credentials to compete for those jobs that require a higher education. The Bell Policy Institute says that the Denver metro area labor challenges are reasonably representative of what's happening statewide. Ultimately, the city faces a stark dilemma. It needs more skilled workers, but doesn't have the housing infrastructure to accommodate its own population, let alone more people. Simultaneously, Denver is dealing with an influx of migrants. There is rather an overwhelming homeless population in Denver, which is a blight on the city. A lot of it has to do with migrant workers who have come in and just a to be sure, a, a big drug problem in Denver, and that's caused a lot of homelessness. What the city is trying to do is to solve that temporarily, at least by building some tiny homes or trying to house them in other places. It's not part of the Denver real estate market. Denver received 40,000 migrants in 2023, and the mayor estimates that the city will need $100 million in 2024 to pay for their housing, schooling, health care, and other services. These costs have now led to budget cuts for local recreation centers and city services but there could be a silver lining. In the long term, we can we benefit, of course, from the immigrant presence in our state. Again, as long as they have work permits and are legal. The vacancies in our labor economy, right? So the top three are healthcare, information technology, and food service, right? Now, so not just anybody can work in any job. And so there are obviously language barriers, education and workforce barriers. And, and so, I mean, there's no question that in this labor shortage, there are certainly opportunities for some of these migrants to work in these positions. However, the timeline to obtain a work permit is lengthy and the associated costs can be prohibitive. And I will get calls from CEOs every day who say to me, Mike, I saw you had 100 more migrants arrive today. I got 100 open jobs. Can I please hire them? And the frustrating part is we got folks here who want to work. We got employers who want to hire them. We have a federal government standing in the way to say that they can't go to work for folks that want to hire them. And that is for us the most frustrating part of the crisis. In 2012, Colorado legalized the sale and use of marijuana. Sales have added $15 billion to the state's economy with about $2.7 billion in tax revenue. Those dollars could help fund future housing development. The, the sales tax in Denver funds things like affordable housing. It funds things like support for women and minority-owned businesses uh, here in the city. Uh, and so it does have dedicated revenue streams that support us. S statewide, the revenue stream helps support school construction in rural communities around the state. So we have put the tax base to work. Um, uh, and it's been a really successful industry for us. One longer term solution to affordability could boil down to an improved transportation infrastructure. In 2022, 1.6% of Coloradans use public transit to get to work, which is about half the national average. Passenger rails and bus systems could help connect job seekers to areas of the state where their skills are needed most. The Regional Transportation District has put forth a proposal for an intercity rail system that seeks to open up over $100 billion in federal funding for the project. There are affordable places to live in Colorado. And if we can equalize some of those costs by improving transportation between communities, I think we can overcome some of the uh, labor shortage that people are grappling with. But now, after a decade of immense population growth, the relocation trend is beginning to plateau. Redfin.com ranked Denver as number nine in its list of metro areas where home searchers are looking to leave. U.S. Census data from 2020 put the population at about 715,000. 
While the census is only officially done every 10 years, government estimates show stagnating population growth over the past couple of years. With some people starting to move out of the Denver area, you're seeing prices actually start to ease up a little bit. In fact, in February, according to the Case Shiller National Home Price Report, Denver only saw about a 2% year over year increase in prices. And that is a very small increase compared with the top 20 metro markets in the country. I think our biggest challenge is managing the growth that's in place. And a focus on sustainable growth in the future will need to come not just from the public sector, but from the private sector as well. It can no longer just be about attracting, you know, a major company to come and build its headquarters in Denver. There have to be infrastructural commitments that come with that. There have to be investments in the education system. There have to be investments in the workforce training system uh, in order to make sure that when these companies move to Colorado, that there are actually people who can work for them.